Did Jesus Christ actually exist in history? Minimal historicity, minimal mythicism. Well, according to Camille Greger today, he has the Achilles heel to mythicism. He believes the probabilities on the side of historicity and that there's more probability that there was a historical person at the basis of Christianity than there is mythicism. I want you guys to see that obviously both sides see the evidence is convoluted. There's obviously all sorts of issues when it comes to the evidence of Jesus. And Camille does not disagree. At the same time, the probabilities that he uses is the same methodology that was taught by Dr. Carrier. If you guys have not read his book on the historicity, go down in the description and make sure you get it. He's also been on this YouTube channel as well. And we're big fans of both of these guys. We are all about open-minded discussion, and these discussions should be there without having contention. And that's what we're all about here in Myth Vision, open to dialogue. Make sure you guys go check out Doug at Pine Creek's channel. Subscribe to his channel because I'm a huge fan of his. I watch his YouTube channel religiously. He's awesome, man. His stuff is great. Check him out. Check Cam out. Check Camille out. Cam has a Discord group. Down in the description, you guys can go and join that. It's like a chat room to talk about these ideas freely. And there is no judgment. They'll tell you what they think, though. But make sure you guys go join that as well. The Discord group's actually pretty cool. I've already been in it myself. Make sure you guys like this video. Subscribe to my channel and hit the bell. And comment down below your thoughts of this channel or this video that I'm about to do. I have a Patreon. So if you guys want to be members of Myth Vision and join Myth Vision Podcast and help us out with what we're doing, you can go and join our Myth Vision Podcast Patreon. We are Myth Vision. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Your host, Derek Lambert. I have a treat today, and it's going to be a, a very, I guess you'd say, intense program here uh, from our friend here, Camille. And I would butcher your name if I tried to say it in, uh, in its original tongue, but uh, thank you for joining me. Thank you. You did very well. I really appreciate you joining me. Um, it's, it's really an honor to be able to listen to you. I've been watching you on Doug, uh, Pine Creek Doug. For those of you who are not aware of his YouTube channel, you need to be aware because he has a lot of interesting guests and he talks about a lot of very uh, important issues and topics that are pertinent to Christianity and what is going on in, in fundamentalist circles and how to deal with apologetics and the apologist out there. He has all sorts of interesting stuff. So make sure you guys go subscribe, like, comment on his videos. That helps his channel grow. And also up front, Cam, who's another special guest that shows up on Doug's channel, has a Discord. It's down in the description of this video. If you guys like Discord or you're not sure, it's like a chat room area where you can go and Cam has tons of information, uh, academic information for you guys to learn more about the pertinent issues that we deal with with the Bible. I mean, lots of topics. So welcome to the show, Camille. And what are you bringing for us today? I'm, I'm, I'm interested. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, let me just say up front, uh, I'm an atheist, uh, so... But we are going to be talking about Jesus' mythicism, so I just want to clarify that, you know, I don't believe in the Christ of faith, right? So when we're talking about Jesus who was born of a virgin, walked on water, was raised from the dead, yeah, that is a myth. He didn't exist. But I would describe myself as a minimal mythicist, which means I believe that there probably was a Jewish religious leader named Jesus who during his life acquired some followers and he was crucified by the Romans and some of his followers became convinced for whatever reason that he uh, rose from the dead and the rest is history, right? And the, the reason why uh, I'm here today is because um, at some point, uh, I think a couple of months ago, I had a conversation with Joel, who you had on recently, uh, who is uh, a mythicist. And we were talking about the historicity of Jesus and I happened to mention Richard Carrier and uh, who is, of course, a prominent mythicist, um, historian. And it, he later wrote a review of the conversation that's actually about 40 pages long. And I was completely blown away by this because I'm not a professional scholar. And I thought, you know, Richard Carrier uh, has more important things to do than write about me. So I felt obligated to repay the hours that he must have spent uh, writing about me. Um, but the problem is that I have a job, uh, so I don't have as much free time as him. Uh, but I do have a draft of a blog post 
it's not a response to his review. Uh, it's just some thoughts that I have about his work, given that I disagree with his conclusion. Uh, but the problem is I haven't had a chance to, to finish it and publish it. But then you asked me to come on your show and I decided this might be a good opportunity to kind of tease what might be in the uh, blog post when it's finished. And let's see what people think about it, right? Uh, so that's why I'm here. Well, thank, thank you for joining me here. And I know that uh, <clears throat> recently, because by the way, I haven't read that whole blog post. I just know that he had mentioned you. Um, not really, I didn't really delve into reading the whole thing. I was just told, hey, he does, he did mention Camille in a blog post and mentioned something about his methodology when it comes to Bayesian theory and how that affects history or how he's using it towards mythicism, which he writes like, a large portion of his book on the historicity is about that. And I know that you actually disagree with his conclusions. And uh, I think you mentioned that in the video with Joel, even though I didn't watch the whole video either. I have not actually spent my time doing that. I'm here to host you and hear why you actually ultimately disagree with his theory on mythicism. Um, and it's not like a heated, you know, contentious thing. You just, You've come up with different ideas. You sent me this chart. Not sure when you want me to have that pop up, but uh, yeah. yeah, let's do it later. Yeah, it's 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 interesting to uh, say. It's important to say that like the conversation that I had with Joel that started all of this um, was just. Uh, I mean, it was on his channel. It was off the cuff, uh, and a couple hundred people saw it. Maybe more now. Uh, so yeah, I was really surprised that. Uh, Richard Carrier of all people, given that neither me or Joel are like people of any importance, um, pays attention to it. So uh, yeah, I mean, the reason why I'm doing this is because I feel obligated to, uh, you know, give some of the uh, effort that he put into thinking about my thoughts back to him. Um, so yeah, uh, I hope this is going to be productive. Uh, I hope so, so yeah. too. I want to yeah. tell everybody that you are the intellectual artillery behind the Pine Creek Doug YouTube channel. <laughs> so if yeah. you want to know where he's getting some of his fire from, Camille's the man. And by the way, I, I want to mention this up front for our audience. A lot of people ask me, what do you believe, Derek? And honestly, I'm agnostic. I, I tell this to Dr. Price all the time. I'm a big fan of him. I, I, I love his skepticism. Now, is he overly skeptic, skeptic at time? I'm sure. Um, I mean, he's reading some of these, you know, very, very critical scholars, German critical scholars that like are very nitpicky about certain details. And I've heard that said, but to me, I'm going to start with absolute skepticism and work my way into what I can find that makes sense. And so I'll wake up on the wrong side of the bed. And I think, well, you know what, damn it, there was a Jesus. I just don't know much about him, except he was Jewish maybe and, and like whatever. And then other times I'm like minimal mythicism and I wrestle with this idea. So I'm going to be taking notes from you today and learning from you. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I can uh, definitely appreciate that, right? Like who wouldn't like uh, Richard Price? Uh, sorry, Bob Price, uh, first of all, he's such a, an adorable teddy bear. And also I'm a huge Lovecraftian fan, so... Uh, that's bonus, nice. bonus points right there. I, I, I don't personally have any problems with Richard Carrier, unlike other people. I think he's my favorite Ben Shapiro impersonator. Um, so I hope <laughs> this is going to be a very cordial uh, discussion. Um, yeah, I mean, j j so j just to kind of clarify a little bit more where I'm at, I wouldn't say like that, uh, even when we talk a, a minimal Jesus, right? So you take the Jesus that he's, as he's depicted in the New Testament and outside the Bible, and you just strip him to a bare minimum uh, to a point when it even makes sense to talk about a person who actually existed. Uh, I'm not like 100% confident that he did. It's more a question of probability. And I like to say that like on good days, I'm basically 50-50. So uh, I wake up being completely agnostic probably as the same way you are. But on bad days, I would put myself uh, somewhere around 70% 
uh, probability of that person uh, actually existing, which is not very strong. It's probably uh, like my level of confidence is much lower than, uh, well, certainly most New Testament scholars, right? Because they kind of take it for granted. Uh, but I think, you know, it's even though we are not, uh, like nobody's claiming to be absolutely certain one, one way or the other, it's important to realize that sometimes people kind of take it to the opposite extreme. And just because we can't know for sure one way or the other, they just jump to complete agnosticism and they kind of just give up and conclude that, uh, yeah, we can't say either way. I think we can be a little bit more ambitious than that. And we can say, okay, even though we can't be certain, there are things that we can know with less than absolute certainty. Uh, ancient history is one of them. So let's look at the evidence and let's see if we end up being, uh, if we end up thinking that the probability is higher than not or the other way around, right? Um, cool, so let me just maybe uh, just uh, briefly talk about some of the thoughts uh, that I want to share, if that's okay with you. And maybe you can tell me what you think about it. Um, you can maybe try to poke some holes because there might very well be something that I overlooked and you will point it out, uh, but it's okay. I I'll mean, try, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so uh, so here's, um, just like the, I have, a, um, let's say a couple of issues with Carrier's work. Um, some of it has to do with uh, some of the pieces of the evidence he, he analyzes, but I thought uh, I would uh, just uh, simplify it and just focus on the question of prior probability, right? Because um, when it comes to, and I noticed that when it comes to the discussion about the historical Jesus, people very often focus a lot about uh, on the quality and quantity of evidence. And it's true that for a lot of characters who show up in ancient Greco-Roman literature, we have even less evidence than we do for Jesus. Like for example, there are ancient characters who are first mentioned in Suda, which is a 10th century Byzantine encyclopedia, which means that in some cases, they are actually first mentioned over a thousand years after they supposedly lived, right? Like imagine if Jesus was like that, if he was first mentioned not in like decades after his death, supposedly, but a thousand years, right? But historians still think that some of these people are existed, even though the evidence is so bad. And the question is why? And it has to do with the prior probability, right? So when you are evaluating a hypothesis, uh, there are essentially two components to the process. There is the evaluation of the actual evidence and there is the question of prior probability. And in this case, when we are evaluating a hypothesis of a historical person existing, even if someone has a very poor evidence of his existence, we can still conclude that he probably existed if the same sorts of people like him usually existed and are very rarely fictional, right? So for example, uh, we know of a couple hundred ancient historiographers and many of them are only mentioned hundreds and hundreds of years after they supposedly lived. Um, but we also have a lot of examples of his ancient historiographers uh, we know existed. And there are only very few ancient historiographers who are fictional. Uh, so uh, when we just uh, come across another ancient historiographer, we think, yeah, the prime probability that he's typical and not exceptional is probably very high. So yeah, even though the evidence is pretty poor, we are still reasonable to conclude that this person is typical and not exceptional. And so he probably existed, uh, even though we can't say one way or the other with uh, absolute confidence or with absolute certainty, right? Uh, unless of course there is a very strong evidence that this specific character for some reason is the exception and didn't actually exist. And I think, uh, this is the same with Jesus. And Richard Carrier essentially does the same thing. So when he's thinking about probability, he puts uh, Jesus into a group of ancient characters. So people in show up in Greco-Roman literature and uh, he looks at the, the group and he finds out that uh, all the people in the group didn't exist. So he thinks that Jesus is probably not an exception. Uh, he did, probably didn't exist either, right? Or at least his uh, assessment of the prior probability is very low. And then he argues that the evidence is not strong enough to actually overcome that low prior probability. And this and is rank, are, rank Raglan, right? He's using the rank yeah, Raglan. Yeah, so, yeah, so in the book, the historicity of Jesus, and the historicity of Jesus, he uses the rank Raglan heroes. Uh, these are heroes that uh, 
supposedly follows some uh, mythotype. So the, there is a list of attributes that uh, they usually meet. Uh, these would be people like Moses, Theseus, Perseus, Zeus, Bellerophon, uh, Asclepius, Romulus, uh, Hercules, of course, Osiris, uh, and maybe some, some other people. Uh, and, you know, when he's giving talks, he often uh, talks about Jesus in relation to the dying and rising gods, right? So, so like Baal, again, Osiris, Inanna, Hercules, Dionysius, um, Asclepius, uh, Zalmoxis, Adonis, right? So gods that die somehow and then somehow are revived, right? And again, obviously, if you put Jesus into that group of people or characters, you find out that they are all fictional, right? Like we don't think that Osiris actually existed. Uh, so Jesus probably didn't exist as well, uh, or at least the probability is very low. But there, um, when I was thinking about it, I think there is something that he might overlooked and this is where the picture comes into play so if you can put it on the screen and kind of um, have it uh, in there for a while yeah absolutely great. here we go hold on let me pop it up and you should be seeing this yeah i do so um so what i noticed is that in uh, so when you uh, look at characters that appear in greco-roman and ancient jewish literature and share some similarity to Jesus. So they are sons of gods, demigods, incarnation of pre-existing gods, miracle workers, Jewish religious leaders, you know, people who are depicted as culminations of messianic uh, expectations. Uh, and you kind of put them on a timeline based on when they are depicted as living on earth, uh, you essentially uh, get this trend, right? So we are basically looking at uh, when the character is depicted as living, not when the literature about him was written. So, so for example, uh, the Iliad is usually dated to the second half of the eighth century, but the characters in the Iliad are like the story actually takes place at the end of the Bronze Age. So I think uh, 12th or 13th century, right? So the uh, composition of the work is like 300 years removed from the events that it depicts. So in this case, we would be putting, putting you know, Hector and Achilles to the 13th century. Uh, so this is what I'm talking about, right? When the character is depicted as living. And when you do that, for all of these characters that are somehow similar to Jesus, share some, some important similarity, you get this distribution. And you can see that uh, a lot of the characters who didn't exist are depicted as living in a very distant past when almost nobody who is depicted as living back then existed, regardless of whether he is uh, similar to Jesus or not. Like if you think about the Bible, for example, and you think about the characters who show up at the very beginning of the book, like Adam, you know, Abraham, Moses, we don't think that they existed. But if you actually go through uh, to very or more recent history, then you start getting people who historians think are probably real people, right? And it's the same with um, Greco-Roman literature. Uh, so I noticed that all of the examples that Carrier gives, uh, so for example, all of the examples in his Frank Reckland class, and all of the examples of his dying and rising gods, are actually characters who are depicted as living on Earth in a very, very distant past. Uh, but if you actually look at people who are similar to Jesus, but they are depicted as living in a more recent time, roughly around the same period as Jesus, they almost always existed. So the kinds of claims that are told about Jesus, even though we know they are not true, were usually told about people who existed and they were much less often uh, told about fictional characters. Uh, so for example, we have examples of sons of gods, right? Like Alexander or Augustus Caesar. We have examples of demigods or incarnations of pre-existing gods like Apollonius of Tyana. We have examples of miracle workers. We have, of course, many examples of Jewish religious leaders, uh, people who are depicted as culminations of uh, messianic expectations. And when they are uh, depicted as living around the same period of time as Jesus, they are almost always historical. So when you kind of take Carrier's assessment of prior probability and you update it by bringing in this additional factor, which is like a very strong predictor of historicity, I think you end up with a revised prior probability that is actually very low, very high. 
which means that even if you then agree with Carrier that the evidence is not very strongly pointing in either direction, which he, this is what he's arguing, uh, well then you end up concluding that Jesus probably existed because the sorts of people like him usually existed. Uh, so yeah. Interesting. Uh, no, no, no. That, this is <clears throat> this is interesting because I guess we couldn't. It'd be good not to run to the Gospels to try and like start there and say, "Hey, okay, I do personally, I do see a lot of parallel or a lot of commonality, if you will, between Jesus from the Gospels and a lot of these older." you know, stories. There's a lot in common that you find from Osiris, you know, Asclepius, uh, Heracles, Dionysus, and I've been recent, recently reading Dennis R. MacDonald, but even you aren't factoring the Gospels. You're not, you're saying, look, we're not even talking about the Gospels necessarily. If you want to get to the meat of the, the, the crux of the argument, let's look at Paul. And in Paul, you're also suggesting there's enough here to say there was probably a guy, probably. And you start with a good prior probability higher than he does in his book because i think if i'm not mistaken he starts with like there's a third like 33 or 30 percent something like it's like a one third chance that jesus existed and i think he concludes with that at the end he says yeah. it's it's one out of three and and you're saying yeah. something more like two yeah. out of three right you're like saying yeah the, well yeah, the, the, so this is important to get correctly uh because there is a little bit of confusion so in on the historicity, in, in on the historicity, historicity of Jesus, Carrier actually gives two sets of probability estimates for essentially every data point. So every piece of evidence and uh, the prior probability, and then, then of course the posterior. Um, one of them is what he calls, um, or like what he thinks is the absolutely most uh, generous he can be to historicity. So we like if you bend yourself backwards to be as charitable as possible to the idea that Jesus existed, then I th if I remember correctly, his uh, estimate of the prior probability is one in three. And then he thinks that the evidence, uh, if you take this approach, is ambiguous. So on balance, it doesn't really very strongly point in either direction. Like some pieces of evidence he thinks are more probable in historicity, some are more probable in mythicism, but it kind of balances out. So it ends up, you, he ends up with essentially the prior one in three. But then there is the second set of um, probability estimates, which he thinks are his honest uh, assessment, right? So if he's not being super charitable to historicity on purpose, then this is what he gets. Uh, and there, I think the, the estimate of the prior probability is much, much lower. And then what's important is that his, uh, uh, the evaluation of evidence is much more in favor of mythicism in his opinion. Uh, so he actually ends up with a posterior, which is very, very high. It's like over 99%. I think it's 99.9 something, right? Um, and I obviously disagree with that. Um, uh, but I noticed <laughs> that when he's talking about this, like when he's giving lectures, he almost never mentions the uh, the estimates that he thinks are his like honest uh, actual estimates. He always says he thinks the prior probability the um, the probability is one in three. So uh, I'm just a mythicist. So, uh, sorry, I'm just a historicist. So if he wants me, th he if he wants to throw me a bone and be super charitable to my view, I'm going to take it, right? Uh, right. So yeah, um, he would say, like if he was here right now, probably given, you know, the talks that he's, he's gave uh, since uh, the book was out, he would say, yeah, I'm just saying, uh, you know, the probability is somewhere around one uh, in three. Um, and I, I would, yeah, as I said, I would go uh, either 50-50 or, or somewhere between 50-50 and, uh, and uh, like 70-30. Uh, and this is not rocket science, right? Like we don't have any exact as numbers. We don't have any like, extremely large data sets, anything like that. There are problems with all kinds of uh, biases. Like um, obviously the ancient literature that we have available is very fragmentary. Uh, so we are not sure if these distributions were the case in the entire body of lit ancient literature that ever existed. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if you take this into account, uh, this is what you end up with, I think. So what I'm looking at here <clears throat> is in his book on the historicity, he's using these, I guess you'd say, 8th century or 
if you will, very old uh, myths that we, if there was a, a person or if there was ever a historical person, it's so far in antiquity. At this point, we conclude they probably didn't exist until we have evidence otherwise, kind of like we did with Troy. We didn't think it existed till we found more reason to believe there was a city. And in, just an example, or I mean, because it looks to me um, that he, according to what you're saying here, he didn't factor in some of these like closer to, uh, you know, like Jesus Ben Ananias, Simon of Perea, uh, you know, these figures in his book. Did he not cover those? Because the prior probability all matters on what you're going to conclude when you start with something extremely yeah. low and you don't factor in some of these other things yeah so that's that's a great question actually so uh, i'm not saying that he didn't take into account the specific ancient characters what i'm saying is that he didn't take into account uh, like a specific trend like a specific very strong predictor of whether an ancient character was historical or fictional okay. and it seems to me that this predictor is when the character is depicted as living because all of the, the examples that he gives of characters that are similar to Jesus and that some of them he places in the same reference class, and that's how he estimates the prior probability, like all of those people are actually depicting as living in extremely distant past. And the problem is that almost everyone, I, I would say in ancient Greco-Roman literature, everyone that's depicting our, our, as living around that period of time is, is fictional. And it doesn't matter if they are similar to Jesus or not. So I think he might actually be, um, like the, the reason why these people are fictional is not because they are similar to Jesus. It's because of when they are depicted as living, right? Like if you just run through the list, it's actually interesting because Greeks had a, a very sophisticated chronology of their own mythology, right? They, they thought obviously that all of these mythical characters existed. So they were wondering when they lived and they put together a very comprehensive view. So that was a, a, like a timeline and you could place some um, events that never exist, like never took place in, a in like exact years, right? So for example, um, like the Trojan War is usually dated to mid, either mid 12th or mid 13th, um, 13th century BCE, according to these uh, Greek chronologies of ancient uh, history, uh, even though there probably wasn't a Trojan War, right? At least not as, as it's depicted. Right. And the, the uh, second point is, it's very important to realize again that what I'm describing is not about the gap between when the events take place and when the literature is written, right? So the reason why the characters who existed in very distant past probably never existed is not necessarily because like the first sources about them were written very late. And the reason why the people who are depicted as living in like a more recent past are almost or historical is not because uh, the sources that are mentioning them are closer to their own lives. I think there are uh, other reasons, like th there are specific reasons that have to do with literary conventions for why this trend exists. Like just uh, as an example, one of the reasons why the trend is like that is because when um, authors of Greco-Roman literature and ancient Jewish literature invented fictional characters, specifically fictional characters that share similarities to Jesus, they usually depicted him as living in very, very distant past. Like one example is Seneca, who is roughly contemporaries with Jesus, uh, who wrote, like he wrote uh, roughly about the same, uh, around the same period of time as Paul. And he writes about uh, gods who never existed. But what he doesn't do is he doesn't invent a new God and he doesn't depict that God as living in his own time or like 30 years before his own time. Right. He, he writes about media, you know, yeah. who is a character depicted as a very, in a very distant past, past, you know, he writes about Jason, he writes about, uh, you know, Athena, um, stuff like that. So it seems to me this just wasn't something that these people did. Um, it could be, of course, the case that Jesus is exceptional and there are reasons why uh, the authors of the New Testament and the founders of Christianity did that, even though other people in their own time didn't do it. Uh, but exceptions are 
by definition improbable. Like they are infrequent, so they are improbable. And if they were not infrequent, we would have more examples like that, and we don't. Right. It seems to. So, if you don't mind me asking a question, <clears throat> because this actually comes to a, kind of a root problem I found with the New Testament and this whole trying to figure who the guy is, you know, trying to find the the historical Jesus for me. Um, it, it's strange to me, and I'm sure you probably share this, uh, this like eager, like, uh, why Paul is like following and worshiping this, uh, forgiving dying and rising guy, Jesus, if he only died 20 years ago to me, 20, 30 years ago from the time he wrote to me, and I'm not saying it's not possible. I had a rabbi Tovia singer come on and he was like, have you ever heard of cognitive dissonance, Derek? And I'm like, Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> but uh, he's like, I don't know if you know the power of cognitive dissonance, but anyway, it's a very powerful thing. But how a theological system has developed around this guy in such a short amount of time to me, is just, it's, it's amazing. I mean, if he is a historical guy from the 30s, it's amazing. And so I factor in these different ideas and I just have this hard, I have a hard time like swallowing that pill and I don't know if you've experienced the same thing as me when it comes to this man named Paul who somehow wasn't in direct communication with a Jesus on earth, but he had known maybe of disciples who were, has this dying and rising. Did he recreate an earlier movement? Is this like a, a mystery school blend uh, attaching itself to a guy in history? Um, you know, I just have a hard time wondering how he has such high theology in such a short amount of time. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, what I'm just wondering if, like, is if mythicism really solves that problem, like if it's uh, a much better alternative, because on mythicism, you would have to push the actual origins, like unknown origins of Christianity farther back in time in order to solve that problem, right? So you would need more time for the theology to develop. To develop, And then of course you have the, the problem of, um, like these, these people became convinced that this uh, person, th- there is this divine being uh, that never existed, right? So if you, for example, think that Paul became convinced that Jesus is the Messiah is this divine being because he had some kinds of experience and he concluded that um, this is true. Well, then it doesn't matter if there was a historical Jesus or not. Like in that case, events play exactly the same way, right? Uh, so yeah, uh, I, I'm not really sure how like mythicism solves this problem. And it's like, it's definitely true. And the carrier writes about this very extensively, that you can essentially, it seems to me that to a large degree, you can piece together uh, the core of New Testament theology uh, from the Old Testament and from essentially Second Temple Jewish beliefs, right? Like, yes. so there could be some um, some tangential uh, evidence, like in some cases better, in some cases worse, that, for example, um, the Son of Man uh, was already uh, identified with the Messiah uh, before Christianity started, or that, uh, yeah, the, like Daniel was already um, interpreted as depicting a dying Messiah. Uh, you can argue, for example, that the Son of Man was already identified with uh, the uh, suffering servant from Isaiah before Christianity started, right? Uh, but again, like if you are convinced of this, uh, then doesn't really make any difference if there was a, a guy who these theological ideas were associated with or not, right? right. Like it, then history essentially plays exactly the same way. Uh, it doesn't really seems to me uh, that one is uh, extremely more probable than the other. It wouldn't matter, right? I get what you're saying. So whether there was a historical guy, and that's why like, I, I like to put it, just my opinion, and, and I love how you're factoring in this evidence. I always put like, there's a 50-50 chance. He was either a historical guy or he's not a historical guy. Kind of like the creation arguments that Christians come in. Well, look, dude, you've got a 50-50 chance. God either did it or he didn't do it, right? So I'm just playing that role. But uh, I start with that guess, and you bring up a good point that I think, if you don't mind me sharing something else that I, I uh, me and my buddy, I, I I can't name them. Uh, we were talking about some of these things and um, 
talking about the prior probability concepts and why you start with a higher. And now everybody can see why you start with a higher probability than the low probability that Dr. Carrier brings in. Um, let me share this screen with you. Uh, here we go. So Bayesian calculator right here is interesting. So you start with 0.67 approximately or something like that, just to give a rough calculation. That's pretty much two thirds rather than one thirds, if you will. Uh, instead of starting with like one out of three chance that, you know, uh, historicity is the case, it's a two out of three and you're still giving a 33% chance technically that, you know, mythicism could be the case. But when you factor in a lot of these uh, ideas here that should change the prior probability and, and ultimately you come up with a different conclusion than Dr. Carrier does. So I wanted to show that real quick, if you didn't mind. Uh, some yeah, of absolutely. These things. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. So, so, I mean, it's, it's important to still realize that we are talking about the prior probability, which is like one component. And then there is a lot of individual pieces of evidence where they have like each, each individual piece of evidence has its own probability estimate, which essentially gives you, it tells you whether it's uh, supports uh, historicity or mythicism, right? It's, it's more likely that the evidence would uh, look like the way it does, if historicity was true or uh, mythicism was true. And that, of course, takes into account absence of evidence as well, right? Like if we have, for example, something that doesn't exist, but we think it should, if historicity is true, well, then that's uh, evidence for mythicism, right? So it's absolutely true that it could be the case that if you start with a very high prior probability, you still end up thinking that Jesus probably didn't exist if you think that the evidence is favoring mythicism. And uh, we could go through these individual pieces of evidence and talk about it one by one. Because uh, when I just look at, when I just take the, the numbers from Carrier's book, go through them, uh, in some of the cases, I don't, I basically agree completely. I don't have anything uh, substantial to say. Uh, in some cases, I would uh, put the uh, probability differently. Like, for example, I agree with his, like the direction, but I think the magnitude is incorrect. Like I would probably put uh, the probability estimate, like fa for example, favoring historicity or favoring mythicism the same way he does, but I would just uh, make it, make that hypothesis favor more. Uh, and in some cases, I just disagree with the direction, right? I think what's uh, sometimes the case is that he just uh, jumps to the conclusion that a given piece of evidence is expected on mythicism, because if Jesus didn't exist, then the people were free to invent, uh, the, the, the relevant people were free to invent kind of whatever they wanted, right? But I think some of the uh, pieces of evidence wh where he thinks, which he thinks are expected on mythicism are actually at least equally unexpected on mythicism as they are on historicity. Uh, but this is something that I kind of want to avoid, right? Because then you are playing a whack-a-mole and you're just jumping from like one piece of evidence to the other. Right. And also when you start talking about evidence, it tends to get bogged down to extremely like minute details about interpretations of Galatians 119 and whether it says other than the apostles or other of the apostles in the original Greek and stuff like that, right? Like I never want to have another discussion <laughs> of the brother of the Lord because this is, this is something that people bring up all the time because yeah. like I have to say most historicists, like most people, even people who are casually interested in uh, ancient history, don't actually know how to argue uh, Jesus' historicity. And they think uh, specifically that there are just a couple of knockdown arguments, usually like knockdown passages that you can point to. And it just proves that immediately that Jesus existed, like Testimonium Flavianum, uh, the rules of the age, uh, Jesus was handed over, the night Jesus was handed over, you know, right. like various things. And because they don't actually care to read uh, what someone like Richard Carrier has to say, they are not aware 
that medicines have actually done a lot of work around these passages, right? Uh, so that's why these debates are usually always about these couple of small passages. Uh, so that's why I like to focus more on the prior probability because it's much more interesting. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I think that, uh, yeah, that there is probably like a substantial uh, objection um, because it, like, it seems to me that there is at least one very strong predictor of historicity that is not taken into account. It, I got one. I got one more chart. I got to bring up if you're okay. And this one's actually sure. goes in line of what you're discussing here, um, <clears throat> because what it appears to be is minimal historicity has more explanatory power, even if you do think something is mythology. It doesn't take away that there may have been a historical root to it. To it. So, like begotten of a woman begotten under the law. One could say it's allegory, minimal mythicism. It still doesn't mean that this couldn't have been really a guy that they're making a allegory about. So, so the, it's kind of like minimal historicity kind of outweighs the, the overall yeah. Evidence. Yeah. Does that make sense? No matter exactly. what. Exactly. Yes. So, so this this is also very important. It's like again, this this has to do with evaluation of the evidence, not the prior probability, right? So this this is the part of the uh, discussion I don't mean that to I do want this to. to you. <laughs> but that's okay, right? But th this is like a more important meta point, right? So as you mentioned very correctly, there is a lot of pieces of evidence where which could potentially uh, favor historicity. But uh, there isn't any like silver bullet, right? You can always kind of argue around it. You can say it's it's an interpolation. It wasn't in the original text. There is a mul there is multiple ways how to interpret it. Uh, so you can always wiggle around it because that, that's why mythicists are exist, right? Like if there was a silver bullet, mythicism wouldn't be around. Right. The, the problem is that it seems to me that out of all of the possible readings that are on the table. Only some of them uh, must be true for mythicism to go through, and minimal historicity is usually able to accommodate a much more uh, alternatives, right? So when we uh, when you look at, for example, the night uh, in which he was handed over, yeah, it can mean a number of different things. But the problem is that for mythicism to be true, and specifically carrier's mythicism to be true, it must mean Jesus was handed over to the powers of Satan by God in lower heavens on like a subliminal orbit, or, orbit right? Like, o almost any other alternative makes at least uh, minimal mythicism much, much less uh, probable, right? Uh, which would, would be fine if we were just talking about one piece of evidence. The problem is there are so many of them, right? Uh, so it becomes like the problem with uh, conjunction, right? Mythicism can only go through if a lot of these individual pieces of evidence are interpreted in a very small number, usually uh, particular ways, while uh, historicity is much more flexible. Like I have absolutely no problem in many of these instances with the idea, for example, that the language in question is allegorical because Jesus it could be the case that Paul is talking allegorically and there still was a historical Jesus. But a mythicist cannot do the same thing in reverse. He cannot say, yeah, Paul wasn't talking allegorically. He was talking about the real guy, but Jesus still didn't exist, right? That's uh, still possible, but it's admittedly much, much less probable. Um, so uh, I was reminded of this, like the same problem. I know, I don't know if you know uh, Mike Winger, uh, yeah, he's a yeah, Christian. Yeah. yeah, he's a Christian apologist, and he recently did a video about flat Earth in the Bible. Because, as we all know, obviously, the Bible teaches flat Earth. Yeah. That was the standard cosmological model in the ancient Near Eastern world and in um, in the ancient Greek world as well. Like in, uh, for example, Homer and Hesiod, uh, the world is flat. It even gives you the specific dimensions. Um, so that's uh, um, not ambiguous. The problem is, of course, that if you are a Christian apologist, you have to do a lot of explaining. And the way how he goes about it is he lists the passages that are usually pointed to by Christians who believe in flat earth as evidence for flat earth. And he says that in every single instance of a passage like that, there is a potential meaning that can salvage the idea that the earth is a globe. 
So you can always wiggle your way out of it. But the problem is that there is so many passages where you have to do this much work. And they would have to all be true at the same time. Because if there is even one passage where the author really did think that the earth is flat, then the Bible does really teach a flat earth, at least in that one passage, right? Um, and this is kind of equivalent because, uh, yeah, there is a lot of uh, different pieces of evidence which are ambiguous, but the problem is that if even one of them favors historicity, well, then historicity becomes much more probable. Mm -hmm. uh, so like a mythicist needs to tweak a lot of knobs at the same time. And I think us historicists don't have to do it nearly as much, right? Um, so yeah. Good point. That's a great point, uh, Camille, because <clears throat> there's... Like I mentioned prior to the show that I'd like to get a book out for that whole movement that I was talking about that thinks all genetic uh, descendants of Abraham are the Gentiles. They're lost Israelites in the New Testament. They're being saved. If you find one place where somewhere in the New Testament, it does teach that the message goes beyond the scope of the 12 tribes, genetic descendants, then what you could conclude at that point is there was a original Jewish only movement that evolved into something much bigger. And I think that is what we're going to probably conclude, but I don't want to presuppose before I have evidence to make a case because I mean, why did the church develop into what it is today? If there wasn't differences of, of Christianity, different types of opinions that began to evolve and, and different churches developed. And eventually of course, pagans, lock, stock, and barrel started to swallow this pill and, and said, hey, this is the way. We're going to believe in this. Um, Non-Israelites started to believe it. So anyway, I, li I like what you did there because, you know, I always tell people sometimes it isn't the idea that we're proposing that's wrong. It, it might have that teaching in certain places, but the text itself, you know, trying to harmonize the text itself. I'm not trying to rabbit trail into undesigned coincidences or anything like that, but we harmonize so much to try to make things work. I'm trying to be more critical today in my thinking and learning from, you know, very good scholars on how to approach this information. So if you found a historical Jesus anywhere, then it does hype up the probability that there was someone that started this thing, or at least it's based off of. Yeah, well, I mean, someone started it, right? The question is if he was named Jesus and he was crucified. But yeah, I mean, uh, I absolutely agree. Like, people tend to do this uh, kind of thing with all kinds of stuff, right? Like conspiracy theories, yeah, flat earth, different uh, religious interpretations, like right? Calvinists do it with some biblical passages, Armenians, open theists, right? Like, the one thing uh, I think that people tend intuitively, like one mistake that people intuitively make is that when they come across a passage which is ambiguous as to whether it supports their hypothesis or an, al or an alternative. They say, well, okay, it's ambiguous, so the chances are 50-50, right? But the problem is that it's very often the case that like, there is a range of possible meanings that a passage might have, and your hypothesis can only accommodate a very small range. And the alternative, can accommodate a much more, uh, like much broader range, right? Like when you, for example, think uh, Paul saying something, Jesus was born of a woman. Well, Carrier, in order for uh, his uh, minimal mythicism to go through, pretty much has to argue that Paul was talking metaphorically, that he, he wasn't talking about, you know, actual woman, whether he was, whether she was named Mary or not, right? That could be uh, from, from later tradition. But I, as a historicist, don't have to do it. I can say, okay, maybe he's talking about the real person that actually existed, like a biological mother, or maybe he's just being metaphorical, right? Like I don't have to defend only one very narrow reading, uh, which like this would be totally fine if that was just uh, one or a couple of things. But the problem is that for a curious version of mythicism specifically to go through and end up being very probable, you have to do it with so many things at the same time, right? Like he postulates several um, interpolations that are not um, a minor majority view in uh, biblical scholarship. He, of course, postulates uh, interpolations in extra biblical texts. Yeah, like uh, these kind of things start adding up. Uh, and if you tweak the, if you, if you start tweaking the numbers in his uh, probability estimate, uh, then yeah, you would probably end up with a prob probability that is. Uh, higher than 50% in favor of historicity, to be honest. That's interesting how you said that. It made me think because 
my, I guess what I was going to ask is technically if it was born of a woman, as in like the Hagar stuff that Galatians talks about, as if it is allegorical, you mentioned that if like, there's a lot more to the story, there's so many more areas that we have to hurdle. And if the explanation is not as clear, um, like you have to put it in the lower heavens or you have to have it instead of it being the Romans, it's demons or something And and you can make a case, but <clears throat> At what point, this is where I think the debate starts to happen is over these de- these details. If let's just say Carrier was right, totally speculate and say Carrier's right on, on most of his assumptions that this is mythology and that it is uh, in favor of this idea of the angelic concept of Jesus, et cetera. Does that still take away from historicity? Um, and at what point would you draw the line and say, okay, if he was right about this many things, then mythicism would be the case, but I'm not convinced that he's right about these things. Is there any way you could format that? Or uh, that, that's a, that's a good question. I will I will think about it, <laughs> because like I I can go through uh, the, the, there is a lot of different. So in my mind, I have the same table that he has in his book with the Bayesian estimates, right? And I've kind of tweaked some of those parameters because I like, disagree with him on a couple of points. To a like different degree, right? Uh, and there is a lot of different ways how you can tweak the table, and it still gives you Jesus being more probably fictional than not, right? Uh, so yeah, like I can maybe imagine, like I can I can imagine him being correct where I don't think he is, or like we have a different opinion, different view on that. Uh, but I would have to see like how how it ends up, and there is probably like multiple different ways that eventually get you to the same same uh, conclusion. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, um, the, oh, then of course, like going back specifically to Paul, then uh, of course, much more interesting question is why is it the case that there isn't a single bullet in Paul's letters, right? Like, why is it the case that Paul doesn't unambiguously mention Jesus on Earth, right? Because uh, yeah, all of these passages can be read ambiguously. Uh, sometimes you have to like stretch it a little bit. Sometimes you have to posit an interpolation to actually get rid of it, uh, get rid of the problem completely. Because in some cases, uh, if uh, the passage in question was in the original text, then mythicism is very, very improbable. <laughs> At least uh, it's improbable that Paul wasn't uh, talking about a guy on earth. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean that's uh, that's a completely legitimate question uh, that like New Testaments have to uh, answer anyway. And like, even if they think that Jesus probably existed, it's still very important to ask why is it the case that Paul isn't apparently interested in talking about him, right? Um, yeah, it it would be interesting. And I, dude, I I'm sure you probably have enough to do in your life than to sit here and make charts for everything. But I would love to see like where you take the points that, you know, can weigh in um, for or against and kind of do a calculation and say, you know, if he's right about this point, um, then this and I, and all the other ones he's wrong or, you know, whatever. And you, you could take it through and show like if one of these points ends up going on the side of historicity or this is, it teeters back and forth based on the calculator, which at the end of the day, the calculator is great, but it's just a model trying to figure out whether there was or wasn't. And yeah. that's what's interesting about this whole thing. Yeah, I mean, I think there are some people who are doing that. Like, they, they, like I know at least one guy who uh, is drafting um, essentially a book in response to Carrier. And he is thinking about basically like uh, tweaking the numbers uh, the way how he sees it, which is fine. Like uh, a career actually recommends this, uh, people doing this in, in his book, right? He says, okay, th- these are my estimates. And if you think the numbers should be different, then by all means, uh, come up with your version. And th- this is why I like Bayesian reasoning so much, because it's oh, like, obviously everyone understands that the numbers are just, it's not like hard data. We don't actually know any of these probabilities, but it's a very nice mental representation of the way how you think about various arguments, right? Like if you put a number on it, then it makes your thinking transparent and you are less likely to make uh, inference, like errors in inference because yeah, basing epistemology, the the inferences that we make should follow some uh, 
principles of probability uh, in order for them to be valid. Um, I was of obviously thinking about doing the same thing, but the problem is I have to go to work every day. <laughs> well, I, 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 to, 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 like, to be honest, um, yeah. I was uh, thinking about um, like wh where should I put the attention, whether it's uh, counter apologetics or Jesus mythicism. Right. Yeah. Because I th yeah, I agree with Carrier that there hasn't been any good uh, defense of historicity, uh, and I ab absolutely think that uh, like in ten years I would probably be uh, qualified enough to write it. Uh, but uh, I asked around what people want me to do, like ask them like if you had to pick between me debating Carrier about Jesus mythicism or me debating I don't know Mike Lacona about the resurrection. Pretty much everyone said, do the resurrection. Yeah. I think probably because people think like Christian apologetics is more harmful. So it's more important to combat it, even though it's not necessarily the way how I think about it. Uh, so yeah, like now I'm much more thinking about undesigned coincidences than like First Thessalonians 2, uh, 14 to 16, I think. Honestly, um, that's a huge question on this channel, the historicity, but I'm going to tell you, that's not all this channel's about. And we've mm. been growing and evolving as a channel, um, trying to bring in different things than just this. In fact, when I reached out to you, I wasn't even like, honestly, I was not trying to even have the... I wasn't even trying to say, hey, come talk about the historicity. I, I always ask guys who are interested in stuff like this to come, but like I want to do a show where we do talk about the undesigned coincidences because there are people who are non-believers that are still using a methodology, what I like to call a harmonization methodology, and I'm not certain they should because a lot of these people who have deconstructed may not have read some critical scholars who take a book at a time, they look at authors, and then even in, within some of those books, how there's different authors that helped compile some things, things like that. They don't even look at that. What they do is they read a passage in Matthew 24, they run to Luke, they jump over to John, they read from Acts, they go to 1 John, they jump to Revelation, and it's like, do you, they think all 27 are organically developed together as a unified message that was purposely placed, almost like divinely done, or like 27 of these guys sat together, really wasn't 27 because Paul wrote at least seven according yeah. to critical, but you know what I mean? Like there was this big huddle, everybody huddle up. All right. So here in this passage, I'm going to write, like, it's almost like they developed this perfect system and flow of story. And they don't look at stuff like Acts is trying to cover up possible issues in the early church or uh, that it's copying from the uh, Euripides and the Bacchae and like different elements that, I don't know, that cr critical scholarships come yeah. in. I'd love to have you. Yeah, th this, is, this is very unfortunate because um, when people do that, and obviously the most uh, extreme examples would be uh, like very fundamentalist Christians who just think these are like reports by eyewitnesses. Like I heard a guy recently uh, who thought that Acts was written specifically as a, a doc like a legal document for Paul's trial in Rome before the emperor. Right. So, like, w what do you say to that? Even, um, the, 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 like, if you have this kind of mindset, you are missing on so much in that literature. Like, because I do genuinely think, even though I've been an atheist my whole life, that the New Testament is fascinating. Like, uh, a lot of other pieces of um, ancient Greco-Roman literature is. But if you have this kind of approach, you are missing out on so much like value, artistic value. Uh, and like intellectual value that's in it, right? Because like if you actually think about the New Testament in terms of what I personally think a lot of people agree it actually is, like, um, you know, different authors adapting existing stories different ways because they have different points of view and they want to communicate a different message. It's such a rich tapestry and you can like look at like so many different interesting aspects of it <laughs> that just don't exist even it's not even on the table if you for example think that these are like reports by eyewitnesses or anything like that right? I, I think even like in critical scholars who are obsessed with the idea that there is a historical core in the uh, in the, the text and you have to kind of sift through it and discover the golden nuggets yeah. of things that actually existed are also missing out on that uh, right like because i think um, you know it's a it's a literary creation it's based on it's a retelling of like a different spin on an existing uh, story right it's like um 
uh, a movie version of a co superhero comic book, right? It's uh, the same material but told differently. Um, and so, like, if you if you think about if you think about it that way, uh, it's much more fascinating. I don't blame you one bit for putting your energy towards the counter apologetic. Yeah. I would too, honestly, because you and Carrier, as much as you have your differences, um, you guys have a lot in common, a lot in common. And I think you're both trying to fight the same fight in terms of trying to show, hey, look, this literature is not what you think. You have totally different conclusions on some things, but at the end of the day, I think your bigger fight would be in it, it'd be better to go with the counter apologetics. And I've been seeing your graphs and the things that you present. And um, man, I, I think uh, for me, getting people to see the light is that deconstructing and coming to where we are today and starting to realize this is literature and not being so fundamentalist that God's speaking to me in my mind and telling me to do things what God told me to do, you know, or, you know, some people go to that extreme and they hurt people or, or they don't take science into uh, effect. I mean, we're seeing it today. And I'm not trying to throw this out there. I guess I'm going to say it anyways, but there are people who are absolutely against any type of vaccination, okay? A lot of that is religiously motivated. I'm not talking about people who are not. You have your opinion, that's fine. But there's religious motivation behind a lot of things that – I guess when you start to come into the 21st century, you kind of go, that's archaic. It's time to, you know, start to come out of that. And it, and I think it'd make us better humans. What do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, it's important to say that I'm not like primarily motivated in combating religion. Uh, because I, like, for example, I happened to uh, be born in a country that has been measured as the least, least religious in the world consistently. Uh, so like, my entire family, including, for example, my grandparents, were never religious, and it's not like usual here. Uh, so I, for example, never had the I never had to go through like the process of discovering that one of the key core aspects of my identity that I've believed for like years uh, isn't true. Uh, so I I've not, I was never fr like frustrated with that. I never had the feeling, for example, that other people deceived me about that, which is something that people who came from, especially like very fundamentalist branches of Christianity very often say, right? Like they acknowledge in intellectually that for example, their pastors, don't know any better themselves, but they still feel like they were lied to essentially. So I didn't go through through that. And the the reason why I do this, first of all, is because it's fun and I'm weird like yeah. that. And the second reason is I think it's very important for people to have like a solid uh, epistemology. And uh, yeah, if you have a good epistemology, I think you will deconvert away from Christianity as a byproduct, right? So it's not really the goal. It's just something that happens as a result. And yeah, if you are like different Christians draw the line differently, but it's very often the case then in order to, for you to stay in the religion, especially in some of its more extreme versions, you have to habitually deny like objective empirical reality. And if you train yourself essentially to do that or other people train it in you, then you'll start doing it with other things. Right. And as you mentioned, you know, there is a lot of um, there are probably disproportionately many anti-vaxxers in, for example, evangelical Christianity. Uh, there is uh, like political yeah, conspiracy know. theories that's completely insane right now, right? Uh, in that specific segment of the U.S. population. Um, flat Earth, Flat Earth is another um, conspiracy. Yeah, that, that's, that's essentially completely uh, religiously motivated, right? Like, so I know some flat earthers try to hide it, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, if when push comes to shove, <laughs> they believe it's, it's satanic deception, right? Mm. I know some people who are non-believers who are flat earthers. I'm not even kidding you. I'm dead serious. But, but mind you, you know, they all come from fundamentalist Christianity as they deconstruct. I don't know if their epistemology is the same, but they don't trust science. They think that NASA's lying. They, they're just huge anti-NASA, um, you know, people. Uh, they don't believe in God. They don't believe in the devil. But they recently, within the past, I'd say year and a half, year, deconstructed. And I don't know if they're still doing that or not in some ways of their thinking. But yeah. Uh, I, 
I don't know. Like I came from the, I was told this was all factual and historically true. And you mentioned on a show with Doug that I thought was awesome when you were using the undesigned coincidence and I, we got to do a show on this sometime. I would love for you to bring your charts too. I, I understand you've already done it on his show, but I would love to do another one with, with me and, and, and go into other examples. Cause right now that's a very important thing. I don't know if you know that Dr. Carrier also wrote a response and of course I am his Patreon, by the way. So I get all of the stuff, uh, in my, <laughs> in my feet. Uh, yeah, I think it was, it was a very nice take down. Uh, you know, like there is a couple of things how you can approach it and he did uh, what I think uh, should be done. He's very well qualified to do that, which is just going through the individual examples and showing why this is not uh, valid, uh, within the context of New Testament scholarship. Uh, but what I was uh, like the different idea that I had in mind is actually finding undesigned coincidences, like using the exact same strategy that Christian apologists are uh, using uh, when it comes to the Bible and actually showing that you can find undesigned coincidences in other ancient myths, like Greek myths, for example, you, that we have uh, some myths, uh, like for, for example, uh, about Electra and Orestes that exist in several different versions. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can compare them. There are, of course, differences. And what do you know? You can always harmonize the contradictions and you can always find undesigned coincidences. Um, and this is something, for example, that people did with the Bible code as well, right? So at some point uh, in, in, in the past, there was this craze about the fact that if you take the... Um, the Bible, the Old Testament in Hebrew, and you arrange the Hebrew letters in a certain way, it suddenly starts spilling out meaningful strings of sentences. And it's like talking about JFK assassinations and stuff like that. <laughs> and people thought that this, was, this is deliberate and that they didn't understand that if you have a very large data set, you are statistically determined to uh, start getting meaningful, uh, like apparently meaningful uh, data points uh, just by pure coincidence, right? Like it's, uh, it would be actually weird if it wasn't there. Uh, but a very effective point how to show it to lay people is to take a different, a very large uh, body of literature. I think it was done with uh, War and Peace by Tolstoy in Hebrew. And they just uh, showed that the same Bible code is there as well, right? So it's like kind of like an argumentum ad absurdum. Um, so yeah, I, I, might, uh, I haven't done it uh, very extensively. Uh, I might dedicate some time in, uh, to it. Please. And when I have a couple of examples, that, that would be interesting. And uh, to, 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 you know what's great? Uh, you plugged the Discord server uh, at the beginning. Uh, so of course, uh, the people on the Discord server watched that, those conversations as well. And they actually started giving me examples themselves. <laughs> because if you start thinking as a Christian apologist, then yeah, you will start finding these undesigned coincidences elsewhere. They came up with undesigned coincidences in Star Wars. They came up with undesigned coincidences between the New Testament and uh, New Testament Apocrypha, which is super spicy because, of course, Christian apologists don't think the Apocrypha is uh, strictly reliable. Uh, so I think that's an alternative way how to talk about this. Yeah, you, you actually mentioned that and said, well, if they're going to concede then they might as well start conceding that the miracles and other religious stories are true as well. And you made the point, that's a logical conclusion. And when I started to deconstruct what I did, my approach to deconstruction was different than some of the people I've talked to. I started seeing that Jesus was very much, at least the gospel narratives were fictional and they looked a lot like other stories. That's what helped me deconstruct and it made me start to go, okay, so am I saying that Osiris and the other deities that are similar in many ways, not identical, I'm just saying there are similarities to their dying and there's rising and there's miraculous claims, et cetera. Is my Jesus special? Is this the one and only? And that was, uh, it took me a year at least to try and get through saying, okay, Hercules and Samson, for example, you know, they're so similar. There's so many things that overlap. 
this character, Samson, the strongest man who ever lived, and Hercules, the strongest man, you know, I started to see that my Bible was also similar to other stories. And then Christians, the apologetics, of course, will say, but the Bible's the oldest version and all the others copied from it. And it's like, that's some, some measures of apologetics. The other ones are what the early church fathers tried to argue, you know, that Satan knew that the story of or the, that Jesus was coming or that God was sending his son, et cetera. So he made these counterfeits and I mean, come on, there's so many different things, but that was my, my path. And yeah, I think, yeah. I, I must admit, I think that's when I got into mythicism because it's easy to go from my Jesus is concrete and 100% accurate to, oh man, I found so many problems right off the bat that I went to the opposite spectrum. And I went to complete far fiction and said, this guy's completely fictional. And now I'm beginning in my journey to try and find any historical reliable things and pe put the pieces back together. So I went to the far end and now I personally am heading back towards, okay, there was a temple's destruction. All right. Josephus describes, I started getting into more, if that makes sense, you know, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think this is a this is a like okay approach, right? And the, the the funny thing is, like, if Christianity is if the metaphysics of Christianity isn't actually true, then this is like so what you would expect, right? Like you would expect it to to be a product of its own of its own time and the circumstances in which it emerged, right? This right. is what we are seeing. Of course, it's different because like every religious system, every um, system of ideas is is unique, but it's of of course like fits into its specific environment. You you can see like Christians can see it. I think usually pretty well with other religions, right? Like not not many people actually know that. When um, Joseph Smith, you know, came up with uh, the Book of Mormon, it was already wide, like w w widespread the idea that the Mesoamerican civilizations uh, were actually Jewish and they were descendants of Jews who came to Americas. It was the lost tribe of Israel from the the Middle East uh, at some point in the ancient past, and there was even a lot of different ideas about like. Uh, historical records being written on on golden plates right and what do you know there is a guy who comes up <laughs> with this kind of story right so yeah christians usually can see how you would expect mormonism to look like that <laughs> if it wasn't actually true and i kind of see it with, with christianity as well the, the the problem is that christians usually don't know that much about ancient history in general like particularly ancient jewish and greco roman history outside the bible right like they, they don't they wouldn't for example read um other ancient literature like greek roman of the time to to, to notice those kinds of similarities um yeah yeah you bring up really good points and um like i said and like he said there is a discord group where they hang out and they talk about these things and they're open to ideas. You guys can share them. They'll try and steer you in the right direction with their research. I'm very appreciative that you came on to share your information and how, what you think about some of these things and prior probability. So if you guys check out the book, of course, and you see what Carrie has written, you can understand where Camille's coming from and why he starts with a different prior probability, which will come to a different conclusion. And then, of course, there's the details, like the differences and arguments into the actual details, which we, we didn't have time and won't have time. It would take an entire program, probably two hours easy to go into details and why. And You, you can do an entire show about every individual piece of evidence. <laughs> And I, I have to admit, like right off the bat, that I'm not even qualified to talk about a lot of the stuff. So I kind of have to take a career uh, on his word, right? right. Because I don't, are not that qualified. But yeah. Um, well, I, I really do appreciate you coming on. Um, the show is evolving, and you're one of the reasons to help this show go in the direction you know that I'm trying to head, and that's opening up. Uh, I'm even challenging and having debates on this channel. Um, I'm trying to bring it into more mainstream as well, not just uh, 
ideas that don't make mainstream. So I really do appreciate you coming on and sharing your information. Um, like I said, everybody, Doug from Pine Creek, go subscribe to his channel. You'll see Camille, you'll see Cam and Doug himself. Uh, he gives Pine Creek points to anybody who gets there first. And uh, I like his show, man. He He's entertaining and he just takes you through the mind of a Christian and pause. Did you guys catch that? You know, like he like talks with you through it. Like, no, where did he come up with this? Like who, you know, it's really fun. So please show them some love just to give everybody who's watching this a little tip. If you like the videos, if you comment on the videos and if you of course subscribe to the channels and stuff and watch the whole video through YouTube promotes that content. So if you're a fan of Doug, Doug's channel, watch his videos well, I don't have time. I only have 10 minutes and he's going to go for two hours. Play it incognito or play it on your phone. Turn the volume down. It helps this type of content grow. And uh, you'd be surprised. I mean, before you know it, these channels will get this content out there because that's what we want to do is try to help the world become a better place and to leave, um, at least leave fundamentalism alone, you know, because you can't, once you challenge this stuff and you see it in your head, you there's no way to, keep to the fundamentalist approach it just doesn't work. So do you have anything you'd like to say to the audience? Yeah, just uh, well, last thing I'm going to say, if you ever want to have a debate about Jesus' historicity, then I'm game. <laughs> okay, awesome. Yeah, I'm not the guy to debate you, okay? I'm not... I'm... Sure, no, yeah, I understand that, yeah. yeah. But if you, if you, if you uh, can't find anyone who would be willing to defend historicity, then I, would, it would, I think it would be fun. Um, <laughs> Well, of course, like if it was hypothetically against Carrier, I would have to read his books. Uh, right. I don't want to do that. I've read them like uh, historicity like three times, proving history probably twice. <laughs> uh, I, I have like zero time, unfortunately, to do something like that. But we'll see, uh, you know. Well, thank you for being respectful um, in your approach and the criticisms that you do bring to the table because too often I see, you know, people throw dung or it comes across a little uh, abrasive. Instead, what you've done is you've presented valid points on why you disagree. And um, I do appreciate the respect because that's one thing that a lot of people don't have is have a cordial discussion on topics they disagree on. And you did really, really good on that. And thank you so much for that. Also, I don't know if I could, I'll talk to Dr. Price he would be the only guy, and I don't even know if he debates anymore, but Dr. Price, yeah, I don't you know. think so. I don't think so. Uh, yeah, because he's, uh, you know, it's not uh, not the youngest. Uh, maybe Godless Engineer, right? He's uh, kind of profiling himself on mythicism, uh, at least initially. Um, you know, we'll see. Yeah, I wouldn't mind hosting it, I can tell you that. And if it, if it gets out of control, I'll hit that mute button. <laughs> <laughs> okay. but, but thank you, man. And send my best regards to Doug and Cam. And thank you guys for what you're doing. Um, I hope to get you back on. We can talk about some of these undesigned coincidences and other materials that you have. So when you get a YouTube channel growing, let me know. I'll put that down in the description. And um, you guys make sure you show them some love. If you guys see any more material come from them, help them out. Thanks a lot, brother. Thank you. Bye. Yep. And guys, don't forget, we are Mythvision.